So uh, this was a logo from my uh, website, practicalevolutionaryhealth.com, which I started, oh, I guess 10 years ago or so. Um, so it turns out that all the lifestyle and nutritional elements that affect general health affect the immune system, no surprise. And unfortunately, whoop, wrong one. Ooh, this is a tough one. 12% of American adults are metabolically healthy in the U.S., and we'll talk about that later. Uh, affecting our immune system and our ability to deal with this virus in includes a lot of things going around clockwise, iatrogenic issues, proton pump inhibitors, much overprescribed, NSAID steroids, biologic uh, monoclonal antibodies, all these things interfere not just with general health, but with a properly functioning immune system. We have the food industry that we're all well aware of, social isolation, loneliness, depression. There's evidence that supports that adversely affecting the immune system. Disruption of circadian rhythm, excess of indoor activity, artificial light, cigarettes, alcohol, all of the, these things we understand. Sarcopenia is probably underappreciated as being a very important issue. Uh, Tommy Wood, a friend of mine, gave an excellent talk at Physicians for Ancestral Health on the fact that um, muscle mass is the single best predictor of health span and lifespan. Um, sedentary behavior speaks for itself. Sleep deprivation, stress, pollution. We're all drinking plastic and eating plastic every day, whether we like it or not. Um, a lot of people don't understand that heavy metals in our seafood and in our oceans come primarily from uh, coal-burning power plants, uh, endocrine disruptors, plasticizers, all these things adversely affect our immune system. What helps our immune system are all the things that we talk about in ancestral health, stress management, sunlight, laughter, love, community, sense of purpose, clean air, clean water, nutrition, sleep, exercise, social connection, all those are important. And we're going to talk about data that talks about all of that. No conflicts of interest. I started out um, in economics, was interested in healthcare policy, healthcare management, was a hospital administrator for a few years before I decided to go to medical school. I trained in three specialties, got triple boarded. Um, my early research interests were in cardiovascular physiology. Um, I had a lot of pain management uh, training in anesthesia because of my previous training in critical care. I didn't need to do uh, electives. Uh, practiced operating room anesthesia for um, over 30 years and in the clinic in the last five years transitioned out of the operating room into the pain clinic. <clears throat> I was a vegan for one year with my son. I came out in the morning. He was eating uh, bacon and eggs and a salad. And I said, what happened to vegan? He said, I'm paleo now. I said, paleo, what the hell is that? Um, he told me, I read his books. I went from arguing with him about it to following his lead, so thank you to my son. I, Paulina Sayas is here, many of you know her. Um, she invited me to my first Physicians for Ancestral Health meeting where I gave my first talk there, and I'm forever indebted to her for that. Okay, um, to decrease the risk of long COVID, prevent COVID or at least decrease your risk of severe acute COVID because that's a prognostic indicator for long COVID. You can have mild or asymptomatic COVID and still get long COVID, but the probability increases with the severity of the disease. So how do you do this? Lifestyle, ancestral, most of the talk. Vaccination, there are a lot of anti-vaxxers in this space, and I'm sorry, but um, one, statement about that. Five months into vaccinating in this country, before 50% of people were vaccinated, across the country in every ICU, 90% of the critically ill patients with PCR positive or COVID-like illness were unvaccinated. 10% were vaccinated. N95s work. My niece <clears throat> was a critical care nurse and nursing director. Um, they have to be properly fitted. To test that, they squirt two different aerosols into your face, and if you can taste them or smell them, it's not a proper fit. 
HEPA filters are highlighted. So by happenstance, fortuitously, in South Korea, two years before the pandemic hit, there was a movement in the school system to have HEPA filters put in all of the HVAC systems because of air pollution in the cities. So when the pandemic hit, they had HEPA filters in every HVAC system in the primary and secondary school system, and they worked. There's data to, sh to show that it worked. I gave two talks last year um, on uh, nutritional immunology, and it, there were four hours. So we're going to go at warp speed, faster than the speed of light, through a wormhole of slides today. So I close all of my blogs since the pandemic with these statements regarding ancestral practices. And these all have documented data to support their efficacy in supporting the immune system. And I tried to come up with some mnemonic. So we got the S's, sunshine, stress, sleep, social connection, skeletal and smooth muscle, um, <clears throat> smell the flowers and trees, forest bathing, sauna, heat shock proteins. Sauna's as good as cold exposure. Uh, seafood omega-3s producing pro-resolving mediators. Supplements, Chris Master John has done a great job. Institute of Functional Medicine has done a great job. And my humble website discusses some of that. Short-term fatty acids support your microbiome, soluble fiber. I know there's a, a lot of carnivores here, but there is um, data to support the interaction between your, your gut microbiome and the immune system. Toxin avoidance, the one T. We're surrounded by toxins, including EMR, screen time, noise, skin, food, water, air. I had um, my wife's urine and my urine tested several years ago. We live in an urban area. We're on well water, and I, we found metabolites of jet fuel and all sorts of things. We're, we're not near any industrial area. Uh, studies done um, in Papua New Guinea, 5,000 foot elevation, um, no industry in the area, breast milk having over 100 environmental toxins in those women. It's everywhere. Uh, these are some excellent sources on the interaction between nutrition and the immune system. And uh, Dr. Akiko Iwasaka, if you want to follow somebody on Twitter that will keep you abreast of the latest information on immunology and this virus, uh, she's the person to follow. Okay, so let's get into it. So what makes this virus so bad? Well, there's a lot of things that make this so bad. It undermines the uh, immune system. The innate immune system has evolved <clears throat> in a way that gets rid of most viruses successfully. But in about 5% of patients, it doesn't work well. We've all heard about cytokine storms, overproduction of diverse signaling molecules. In most cases, inflammation resolves and we don't get a cytokine storm. But when it happens, it can cause acute respiratory distress syndrome, also referred to as non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which can cause lasting lung damage and damage to other tissues. It, it can lead to build up a fry brain, so um, this causes blood clots, a deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary emboli, uh, blood clots in the brain, fluid leakage uh, into the lungs, triggering respiratory failure. Usually, the immune system doesn't overreact, uh, but in severe COVID cases, the damage is done because of the inflammatory response that continues after the virus is cleared. Bradykinin storms is not mentioned much in the literature, but it's a, a major problem and contributes to many of the pathophysiologic observations in severe COVID patients, including cardiac arrhythmia, sudden cardiac death. So uh, there are several things that make this virus very different from previous viruses. Asymptomatic, contagious state, 
Um, there is a protein that can block interferon production and the effects of interferon, and this is a key part of its pathogenicity. If your innate immune system can't produce interferon, and if the interferon is not recognized and, and working, the innate immune system does not work. So seven days into symptomatic infection is a key time. Are you going to make it or not? And the hyperinflammatory state usually starts seven days into viral illness, leading to multi-organ involvement in nets. Neutrophil extracellular traps, this can occur with other viruses, but it's a predominant factor in, in critically ill patients uh, with COVID. And uh, the lungs fill up with hyaluronic acid, which creates a gel. Hyaluronic acid uh, can absorb a thousand times its weight in water. And can you imagine a gel filling your lungs trying to pass oxygen in one direction and carbon dioxide in another? So as of January 1, 2021, 6,700 times as many SARS-CoV-2 patients as SARS-CoV-1 worldwide. So big difference. Stro stroke in young people, myocardial infarctions, myocarditis. So brief note on myocarditis. In the past, myocarditis associated uh, with viral illness resulted in about 12% of people needing heart transplants. There have been no vaccinated individuals that developed myocarditis that have needed a heart transplant. There's a big difference between the myocarditis that results as a complication of the vaccine versus myocarditis that results as a result of a viral illness. Pulmonary emboli, DVT, pediatric inflammatory response Loss of smell and taste, recently published, not published, um, not peer-reviewed, but uh, preprint, uh, demonstrates that um, this is a risk factor for a subsequent cognitive impairment with long COVID. So loss of smell and taste, that makes sense, olfactory system connected to the central nervous system. So there's wide estimates that vary. 30% of outpatients, 60% of inpatients develop long COVID symptoms, and we'll talk about what those are. And that was before the vaccine. Okay, we're gonna run through Brady kindness storm, sorry. Um, of course, I've already mentioned most of that stuff. I wanted to introduce you to that term. Okay, so, interferon on the left, SARS-CoV-2 on the right, virus X. So, the red X, interferon is not being produced and it's not doing its business at interferon receptors. That's how people get very sick. It disrupts the innate and subsequently the adaptive immune system. And when it goes very bad, there's a cytokine storm. Here's a, an air sac in the lungs. Okay, obesity and leptin resistance. This is a brilliant 30-page review article. Uh, one of the authors is Pedro Bastos, is that right? Is he up there? Yeah. He'll be talking remotely from Portugal. Um, he and I communicate on a regular basis, almost daily. This is a hallmark study. We've already stated that interferon production early on is inhibited by the virus and that the interferon mechanisms are interrupted by the virus. So if you're obese with leptin resistance and insulin resistance, you've got a double hit. Your interferon isn't gonna work. That's why there's such a high mortality rate in that population. So uh, this is just a graphic des description of, of how this works. So uh, type one interferon, early robust uh, response shows uh, the T cell response, the viral load going up and down, interferon going up and down, T cell response, happy patient. On the right, delayed response, the viral load is dramatically higher. It doesn't drop down. The T cell response also is, is very low and delayed. And uh, when interferon starts to come up, it's too late. And then 
interferon, which is supposed to protect you, actually starts harming you. And uh, some more details about how this works. Metaflammation is a term these authors use to describe chronic inflammation associated with leptin and insulin resistance and obesity. So, too late a response, too weak a response of the innate immune system associated with leptin and insulin resistance. Obese people have a chronically activated immune system, so there's chronic low-grade inflammation throughout the body. And the immune cell insulin resistance, immune cells have insulin receptors, and they become insulin resistant, and therefore they cannot behave optimally, and so there's dysregulation of the entire immune system, both the adaptive and the innate. So there's an energy or a failure to respond. Already talked about these. And, and by the way, I've asked that a PDF file of these slides be made available because I'm rushing through to try and cover a lot of, of topics. So um, this is a graphic uh, display. I co-opted uh, this from an article, but I added a whole bunch of stuff in red. And it shows the multiple interacting feed-forward positive um, feedback systems that occur as a result. And we talked about low income, lack of fresh, nutritious food, and, and um, the food industry, fast food, energy dense, but micronutrient poor, hectic lifestyle, which leads to more fast food, pollution, cigarette smoke, sleep disturbance, all compromising immune function. And I added gut dysbiosis. I don't have a lot of slides on this, but dysbiosis is a major issue in terms of the appropriate immune response, both in terms of lacking a good innate immune response and in causing an excessive uh, response late in the infection. Iatrogenesis, again, many drugs. Proton pump inhibitors more than double the risk of severe COVID. Uh, this was a great article that came out early in the pandemic uh, in Nutrients 2020. So one of the points of this slide is that there are so many nutrient factors, vitamin E, C, beta carotene, selenium, zinc, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, sugar intake uh, being negative, vitamin D important in several pathways, iron, of course, uh, required uh, by immune cells, uh, carotenoids, vitamin A, Proteins, you need protein, obviously, to make antibodies and to mount an immune response. Eating nose to tail is very important because if we just eat muscle meat, you know that we're not getting a good balance of, of proteins. Uh, I mentioned in there the microbiota, short-chain fatty acids, which uh, are the major energy source for the cells that line the gut epithelium. And short-chain fatty acids are also signaling molecules, very important for a properly functioning immune system, both preventing an overreaction or an underreaction. And um, Tommy Wood was a co-author on a study that showed that a ketogenic diet producing beta-hydroxybutyrate probably supplies the gut epithelium with adequate energy, and so that uh, there's no danger if you don't eat uh, a lot of fiber, but that's theoretical, but there's good evidence to support that. But I do think that eating some fiber uh, to support your microbiome is still important. So even though um, I'm not a complete carnivore, um, I'm on that end of the spectrum. Another review article, uh, just to show you the complexity of nutrient interactions with the immune system. I, can't go, I could spend an hour talking about this slide, but I won't. But you can see at multiple steps in the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system that there are so many inputs. And, and Chris Master John talks about this a lot. Hat tip to, to uh, Chris Master John. Um, Specialized uh, pro-resolving mediators, uh, which come from EPA and DHA, are absolutely essential, not just to resolving inflammation, but in supporting the immune system. And we'll see a slide about that later.
Okay, so this comes from a review article um, from NHANES data. And, you know, food frequency questionnaires, they're terrible, but they do provide some data. Okay, so there was an NHANES study, we'll talk about it, talking about all of these uh, nutrients um, that play synergistic roles, and I would add vitamin K2, but let's get ahead. So this is the study. So <clears throat> estimated average requirement, it's a terrible bar. It's such a low bar. It's, it's the nutrient value estimated to meet the requirements of 50% of adults to avoid deficiency. That's a pretty low bar. It's certainly not optimal, but let's look at what this study, based on food frequency questionnaires, which are not great data, but these are the percentage of people that didn't even meet that low standard. And they included sleep, which was interesting. So two-thirds of people in this country are sleep deprived. That, that's supported by a lot of data. So um, interesting thing, copper, because, you know, the best source of copper, five minutes, oh my God, we gotta move. Okay, so ancestral diet meets all of these needs, right? So vitamin D deficiency associated with very severe COVID, um, probably a cause and effect relationship. Uh, vitamin D affects barrier function in the lung and in the gut, and it, it helps produce defensins, catholicidin, which are virucidal, and it modulates the immune system, essential. Pro-resolving uh, mediators, EPA and DHA, important to resolve inflammation, but also important in producing uh, an innate immune response. So omega-3 fatty acids are the good guys. The dark side is omega-6 in vegetable, seed, and grain oils. So the importance of uh, pro-resolving mediators is this depicted here. On the right side, you have inadequate control. On the left side, you have balanced control of the immune system. And in this slide, you can see on the right side that with adequate omega-3 versus inadequate omega-3 on the left side, all the bad things that happen. Uh, Pro-resolving meteors help clear cellular debris, block cytokines, inhibit leukocytosis, and enhance the adaptive immune system. Melatonin, in, in not randomized controlled trials, but in observational studies and in uncontrolled uh, trials, melatonin decreases uh, mortality rate in ICU patients on ventilators and intubated. And there's a lot of good data on that. We're going to flash through it. But it's, it's clinically significant. We're talking uh, hazard ratio of 0.27. That's, that's a dramatic 3 to 1 reduction in, in um, death more studies on melatonin. So when I travel, I take five to 10 milligrams at night. I think it's a good idea. This is from a study or a discussion of melatonin relative to Ebola virus. Effect of sleep duration, uh, let's go back. So um, two studies, volunteers got squirted with rhinovirus in their nose. Um, those who uh, had poor sleep were um, much more symptomatic for a longer period of time. So immune response to vaccination is also affected by sleep. Okay, uh, Paul Offit, a virologist pediatrician, um, argues against treating fever. Fever is an adaptive response. It enhances your immune system. Sauna does the same thing. Heat shock proteins and other mechanisms. So um, don't treat a fever with drugs. Let it run its course unless you get a seizure from a fever, which is very um, unusual and usually uh, does not cause any severe damage. Meditation's been studied relative to uh, measurements of immune function and um, <clears throat> duration of illness during uh, the um, 
winter season when uh, respiratory viruses are dominant, both exercise and mindfulness meditation training decreased the number of days lost from work. Statistically and clinically significant, this, uh, these bar graphs show that. So mindfulness meditation, only 12% of American adults are metabolically healthy based upon not requiring drugs to achieve blood glucose, triglyceride, HDL, blood pressure, and a waist circumference um, or normal measurements. Insulin resistance, and by the way, also leptin resistance is related to all of these so we know that there have been studies that show dramatic results to a paleolithic-type diet within a few weeks. <clears throat> Type 2 diabetes, compared to the American Diabetes Association recommendations, better glucose control and lipid profiles. Most of the people in this study that were insulin resistant improved their insulin sensitivity on paleo. 14 days did it, pretty amazing. Multiple studies done. This one in a metabolic uh, unit at UC UCSF, Dr. Forsetto. Again, tremendous changes within a week or two. This was a six-month study comparing Mediterranean diet and paleo wins out. Uh, great review article. Again, Pedro Bastos is a co-author. So there's modulation of immunity. Studied in many publications. Insulin resistance, obesity, metabolic syndrome, increased risk. Ancestral diets likely decrease. Uh, several um, articles published in the um, integrative medicine literature. This is from the Institute of Functional Medicine. Talks about supplements if you're interested. Um, they talk about the same things that I, I previously mentioned, sleep, stress, sugar, alcohol, vitamin C, D fat-soluble vitamins, zinc, very important. Curcumin, possibly some benefit. Coconut oil has antiviral proper properties. Forest bathing improves the immune system. Stress hormones decrease. Immune function increases within a few days of spending uh, three days and three nights in the forest. Okay, um, lots of different um, estimates for the prevalence of long COVID, probably because of the variants changing and the way they define long COVID. These are factors that contribute to differences in the estimates. So anybody who gets pneumonia or anybody who spends time in the ICU is going to have long-term consequences. So is, is post-COVID syndrome any different? Probably, but there's an overlap between post-ICU and post-ARDS syndromes and COVID. Chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis, um, shares many features and they probably overlap with post-COVID. Lots of nutrient deficiencies found in these people, abnormal natural killer cells and immune dysregulation. So this was a survey of, of symptoms, fatigue, muscle uh, weakness, uh, shortness of breath, multiple systems involved with long COVID number of uh, responses from top to bottom. So different theories, autoimmune, molecular mimicry, and haptine model of autoimmunity, a tissue alteration or binding of a drug or an environmental toxin or a virus uh, resulting in um, autoimmunity, persistent virus and reactivation of virus. And I just read a, a paper published a few days ago that showed um, a immune profile of viral reactivation with EBV predominantly and a antibody response to virus, although no virus of COVID is detected. So the immune system is, I gotta stop. Let me um, see. 
Well, I'm just going to mention the cell danger response theory. This is an amazing um, review article, and, and uh, it explains a lot of what goes on with chronic illness and may explain most chronic illness. This is a fantastic article that uh, talks about measuring multiple metabolic pathways, over 600 metabolic pathways, and identifying um, six is it six and 13 in men and women that have chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, <clears throat> so there's a uh, down regulation of mitochondrial production of ATP that is, in theory, removing energy from the pathogen. So the virus doesn't have the energy to replicate, presumably a um, protective mechanism, but I would encourage you to um, read that article. Yeah, we're going to have to go. I know, I'm over time. So a lot of autoantibodies identified in COVID-19, but a most recently published article that I read yesterday, couldn't put on the slides, thank God, um, uh, shows that the autoantibodies don't seem to have a tissue response, and that it's either um, persistent viral antigen with a non-living virus or reactivation of other viruses. Uh, this is the immune signature that has been found in a recently published study. So autoimmunity less likely to be the culprit in long COVID. And um, cognitive complaints uh, CSF shows an abnormal inflammatory profile with um, proteins in the CSF in symptomatic patients. Um, so I've run out of time. There's a lot more to talk about. I'm just going to say that um, in terms of cardiovascular and pulmonary physiology, there's a discordance between the findings on standard and research testing for cardiac function and pulmonary function, and the symptoms that patients complain of. At, at three months post-COVID, the, there is a strong correlation between the symptoms and the studies with MRI of the lung and the heart and with um, exercise stress testing and other modalities. But at six months, there's a divergence. Even though there are some persistent abnormalities, on average, they're much lower, and um, the, the response is that there, there are symptoms that don't correlate with the abnormalities on testing. So this gives evidence to the fact that it is likely a mitochondrial dysfunction, which lends credence to the theory that I presented earlier. Uh, we don't have any more time, sorry. Um, I thought I'd be able to rush through and cover um, a lot more topics, but a take home message would be that um, with long COVID, there's an immune response. There's evidence of active inflammation as if someone is responding to a viral infection. There, are, there is evidence of reactivation of latent viruses, such as Epstein-Barr. But there are also, there's ongoing antibodies being produced against the SARS-CoV-2 virus, even though there's an absence of any active infection. And um, this may all be explained by the um, theory of mitochondrial um, downregulation and immune overreaction, and there's probably a combination of, of these factors amongst different patients. Um, I'm going to have to end it here because I'd be running way over.